Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm Natalie Appleit. I'm the managing director of the Pulitzer Center. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Pulitzer Center, uh, we were founded in 2006 by our executive director, John Sawyer, in the back there. Um, and we were founded with a mission to raise awareness of underreported international issues. We are trying to raise awareness of the systemic crises that very rarely make the headlines, or when they do, they tend to be forgotten two or three months later. Um, so we do this through a number of ways. The primary way is first by giving travel grants to journalists to cover these kinds of stories. And the story that we're going to hear about tonight is an ongoing one. Um, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago today, um, April 24th, 2013, uh, the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh collapsed. And that certainly made a lot of headlines. Over 12,000 lives were lost. Uh, it was the worst disaster in the garment industry that had ever happened. The headlines you know, certainly paid a lot of attention to this for uh, maybe a month or so, uh, maybe a little longer. But um, we've heard very little about it since then. Um, luckily, we have the fortune tonight to have two wonderful journalists and a wonderful expert and, um, and guest from the Population Council who's going to really share some insight into to what these issues are. So we have, I'll give very brief introductions because we have three people speaking and I know we have a, a lot of ground that we really want to cover. Uh, but we're going to explore some of these underlying issues. What really led to the disaster? Um, what, what, what are the questions that weren't asked at that time? and what are the lessons that we can learn going forward. So Jason Motlock will be the first to be speaking. He was a Kabul correspondent for the time, not for the time, for the time. <laughs> um, he's reported for dozens of outlets across print, video, and photography. And he's done now nine projects with the Pulitzer Center, which probably makes him one of our most granted grantees. <laughs> he's uh, reported from Afghanistan and Nepal to Belarus and Borneo on issues like civilian casualties in Afghanistan to migrant labor abuses in the Thai shrimp industry. Ken Weiss, we're very honored to have Ken joining us as well tonight. He spent a decade writing about science, the environment, and public health for the Los Angeles Times. He won a Pulitzer Prize as the lead writer um, on the series called Altered Oceans. Um, and last year, his series Beyond Seven Billion received much critical acclaim and a lot of attention and sparked a lot of dialogue. Um, he's working on a longer book about this, the issue now, but it's looking at the population growth, but really also focusing on women's issues and looking at reproductive health. Um, and then we will be joined by Sajida Amin, who Ken has specifically asked to introduce, so I'm going to keep my introduction very brief, but Sajida is joining us um, from the Population Council, as I mentioned, and is originally from Bangladesh, and I think he's going to share some insight into women's issues and labor issues and um, how these various pieces relate to a larger global picture. So thank you all again for coming. And I wanted to just say that, you know, for the Pulitzer Center, the reporting is really only one piece. These kinds of community events are really critical to what we do. So from education outreach that we do in schools, both Ken and Jason were out in high schools today. Uh, we'll be doing an event at the University of Virginia tomorrow. And uh, this is what we do throughout the year. So last year we did around 450 events. And it's really key to us to keep the conversation going, not just through news media outlets, but through these kinds of engagements. So I hope you'll continue to join us. I hope you'll sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we have another talk next week on ocean acidification and looking at, uh, we'll be joined by Sarah Cooley of the Ocean Conservancy and Ben Strauss from the Climate Central. We have all the information on our website if you're joined up for our newsletter, you'll get an announcement about that. Um, but Craig Welch, who did the series on the ocean acidification, is going to be joining us. I don't know if some of you may have already seen that or seen his talk here uh, back in the fall. Um, and then we have a very special series that we've launched just recently about women and children in crisis. And you have flyers for those coming out. So please join us. And thank you again for coming. So we'll start with Jason. Good evening. Thank 
thank you all for being here. Um, it's uh, been almost a year now since uh, uh, Rana Plaza, and um, I didn't come to Bangladesh actually um, directly. Uh, I was working in Burma on a project and was aware of the fact that there had been a major fire in Bangladesh the previous November at Tazreen Fashions, where uh, at least 112 workers died, most of them women, in the late night fire. And um, brand name labels had been found amid the, the ashes of the fire. And um, many of these were well known Western brands uh, Walmart, Sears, Shanjiang, and others. And um, jarring as this should have been, uh, very shortly after the fire, uh, it, was, it was business as usual in Bangladesh. And uh, I had heard about a smaller fire in mid February uh, at a factory called the Smart Fashions Factory. Um, and eight people had died, and I was, was stunned learning that this was still going on. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go make a side trip to Bangladesh and see you know, what's going on. Why is this, this industry still producing so many tragic? Incidents. And I don't say accidents, I say incidents. So I made the trip, and uh, within a few days of arriving, I learned that these fires were in fact happening every two or three days at facilities around Dhaka. And a lot of these were not the, the frontline factories that you might see from a highway or one of the industrial zones, but smaller, less scrupulous subcontractors, where a lot of work was being outsourced by major factories who were under contract to, to Western companies. And I went to one place, um, the Smart Factory, which is photographed here, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we think of the factory. It's the second story right here that changes the very notion of what a you know, factory, at least to Western, to Western eyes, is. And it was here the fire took place on the outskirts of the docking. And walking inside, um, I was dumbfounded to say the least. Uh, we went up a staircase, and you could still see hand marks from where workers had been trampled. That they died trying to escape the fire, and um, there was a bottleneck to a locked gate. And um, I walked further in, and I saw the mangled remains of all the sewing machines and heaps of clothing that had been burned, almost unrecognizable, and then piles of labels. And this was kind of the aha moment. I saw um, labels from the company uh, Bershka, which I recognized. It's a, a mainstream um, outlet that you find in Europe owned by the same company, Zara, which we all know. And that was the moment that really hit home that you know, this is something that we were in some way all connected to, or even complicit in, and yet I was oblivious largely to just how um, this connection um, existed. And so that set me going on, on this, this investigation into the, the, the garment uh, industry there. And I you know, met with a lot of labor activists, rights groups, factory owners, um, victims, and so on. Um, one of them was. Um, this girl, uh, Regina Uchter, who uh, was 15 years old at the time, and she lived only because um, someone carried her out. She was knocked unconscious by the fumes. That's why her eyes were bloodshot in the picture. And she was living in a really dank uh, basement, a uh, one-room apartment with four of the relatives that she was actually supporting with her garment work at this factory. And Without an education, you know, she was resigned to the fact that she was likely going to go back to garment work as soon as she was able. And she was having difficulties with her memory, her sight, and so on. But she had received no help from, from any outside sources, certainly not the brands. And, um, that stuck with me. And uh, in meeting with, with activists, subsequently, um, you know, they, they, the sense was that it was just a matter of time given all the apathy uh, in the industry, among the government, and certainly among overseas buyers and consumers among us, that it was a matter of time before another even larger uh, catastrophe happened. 
And so when Rana Plaza fell on April 24th, it was really um, no surprise. Um, this is one of the first pictures I took on arriving. I went straight to the scene and that space, that void behind you is where the building stood. It was a nine-story building. And uh, these were all relatives of, of the missing uh, garment workers who were killed, but whose identities had not been confirmed. And they were there with these handheld, uh, handmade posters um, seeking compensation, some acknowledgments of their loss. And when I walked up, I think a lot of people mistook me for a brand representative or someone from the NGO was going to be there to, to provide some aid. And shit I so I was immediately surrounded and, and literally back against this barbed wire fence you see behind them, people thrusting these, these posters in my face, telling me, where is my child, what have you for me, um, what is being done, and um, you know, I was trying to explain that as a journalist, and people could hear me from the shot. Um, that was my introduction, post Ryan Plaza, and I spent the better part of the next two months reporting on this story. Um, trying to look at all the systemic forces that had conspired to create a run plaza. And in the aftermath of the first garment um, incident in, in history, what was being done to, to make things right? I just want to briefly introduce a few of the, the main characters that featured in the story that I wrote. Uh, it was published in the important review. Um, my challenge here was, personally, it was to cast in as stark relief as possible the, the suffering endured by, by people in the garment industry and to make it very, very personal. And you can imagine that the challenge of trying to distill a story in places as, as um, chaotic and, and uh, populated as Bangladesh um, and find people whose experiences were emblematic of all of these different elements that converged around a plaza. Workers, rescuers, factory owners, authorities, um, and, and the relatives of those who died. And this was a, was a big challenge because there were so many compelling stories. But this is one of the first people I identified. This is Rashida Begum. And that's her daughter, Nassima, and she died. And um, she, had, at that point, received nothing for her, her loss. And um, Rashida, for me, sort of became this um, kind of an emblem for the failures on the part of um, all of these parties involved in this industry um, to do right by the victims. And I would run into her from time to time at Rana Plaza in some part of this area where she lived uh, at the headquarters of the, the trade body that represents the garment industry um, at the DNA lab in Dhaka. And um, the story concludes with her. In the end, she was able to get some confirmation closure, but it was ultimately a pittance. Um, these are two uh, girls who lost their mother. This is um, Atifa and Arifa Rahman. Their mother, Rina, was working in the factory. This is the document that uh, was found on the body of their mother to secure them compensation. It was proof of her identity. Was, uh, I, think, uh, I'm not, I can't translate that exactly, but I think it was, it was a government document of some sort. And this was after many days of searching among rows of corpses. And it was actually the girl, the 12-year-old Arifa, who found it. It had been set aside, and that was how she was able to finally um, find out about her mother. This is uh, Rafiqul Islam, who was a real hero. He was a bricklayer who was working nearby <laughs> Rana Plaza. And um, initially, he had thought that his daughter was working there, and so he bolted to the site, and he found out that she was actually at a different factory. But he felt compelled to dive in, and he spent the better part of three weeks um, hauling people out. He claims more than 700. But he uh, ultimately, as, as things became desperate, was forced to extract uh, seven or eight by hand with a saw. And um, you can just look in his eyes and you get a sense of what this, this man went through. And um, you know, guys like him. Um, unfortunately, have not received much help, psychological counseling, um, financial support. He's unable to work and support his own family because of it. This is Paki Begum, who's working, I believe, on the fifth floor, and she lost both of 
her life. Um, and she's fortunately received substantial compensation from the government and is um, undergoing therapy here in the European public clinic. And um, she's small, but she's, she's a powerhouse. And she was um, undiminished by the experience. I mean, she lost her legs, but uh, she by no means um, postures herself as a victim. Um, she just wants to ensure that you know, these sorts of things don't happen again. And, um, she uh, has decided to, to leave DACA and go back to the countryside to get her daughter so she can raise a family. And just a couple of parting shots um, of those who you know, have not uh, found answers for um, their loved ones. Uh, there are still many people who have been paid anything. Um, there's a compensation fund, but it's not even half funded. And um, because the DNA analysis um, is over, many people will likely go without uh, without any sort of support. Um, before I pass the microphone, you know, I just outlined sort of my um, mission on this trip. You know, one thing that we, we highlight in the BQR story is just how important the garment industry is for Bangladeshi women in particular. And it's been a vehicle of empowerment for, for legions of women, especially those who are coming in from the countryside, who know a degree of uh, mobility and agency that they haven't seen before. And you know, while the story paints a very stark picture, um, there are still many, many other facilities that do an admirable job of looking after um, their employees. And I know that Ken and Sajra will go deeper into this. But this is this is just one of them. And um, this is a frontline factory producing for major brands. I think these were going to the And uh, you know, these women receive a decent wage, um, the child care facilities, all the basic safety protocols were being met. And um, when spoken to, you know, many of them were, were really um, happy to have the work. And there were even opportunities for advancement in the organization. And I remember going to one organization and talking to an employee who had been promoted, a woman, and asking her what her goals were. Was she happy with the job? And what her goals were? And she pointed to the managing director of the firm and said, I want his job. <laughs> 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 And that was, to me, that was um, a beautiful moment, but also telling of, of just um, how these opportunities have, have changed the mindset, not just the practicalities of living, but the mindset of living. Do you want to share a quick Yes. Yeah. And um, so this, this story is out. It's uh, a very long story. I think it's about 12,000 words. So it's asking a lot these days um, for those who may be less inclined to uh, go the distance. This is a, um, a multimedia interface that's, that we've created that's sort of a, a companion to the uh, narrative that's printed. And uh, basically, it's a distillation of the primary characters that figure into the Ron Plaza story. And you have many different um, options here. You can sort of zero in on one of them and just follow their narrative scene. Or you can jump around and sort of see where, where people were at certain moments of the story. And it's also um, supplemented with, with some video and uh, sound and photos just to give you a more vivid illustration of, of what was going on. So I would encourage you to check that out. It's going to be done very soon. And, um, Thanks, week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that will be for iPad and iPhone. Um, I think it's it's a um, useful companion to the narrative. And um, what do we do? Pass them. And I'll also have um, shareable to the social media elements. So for those of you on Twitter and Facebook, there should be some options for sharing it. Like. Thanks, Jason. Well, um, I did read the whole 12,000 words, and I'm just going to put a plug in for this magazine piece. Um, I felt like I was suffocating. I was trapped in the rubble. Um, there were some three hanky moments there with a 
a woman begging to have her legs cut off so she can join her children. I mean, it is a very powerful piece, and I would encourage you to, to go the distance. Um, I'm going to just switch up a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, really close. Okay, I'm, eat the mic. I'm going to just uh, switch up a little bit and go to less towards the tragedy and more to the routine. Just a little bit of a peek inside a garment factory because we're all curious about it um, and the lives of a couple of its workers. And I just want you to know that um, for a Western journalist, as you can imagine, it's not really easy to get into a factory um, with all the bad press and such. The last thing they want to do is see someone like me show up. Um, um, I still managed to get inside one. Um, here's the boss. You can see from his expression how thrilled he was to have me <laughs> in this factory. Um, it's a relatively small one, um, uh, and I say relatively, it's got 350 workers. It churns out about a half a million uh, women's blouses a year, all bound for North Carolina at that discount price of $15.99. Um, some men work in the factory, as mostly as, as, uh, uh, as textile cutters, and they do the heavy lifting job for the most part, I think about 90% of them. Are women, and that's um, that's uh, pretty typical. Um, and I just want you to put yourself just uh, in the place of one of these, um, just to get an idea. This is Mukta Mola, who I was learning today. Mukta means pearl, and she's 19 years old, um, and uh, one of four daughters of a farmer um, in a small village near the um, border with India. And uh, when she was 15, four years ago, her father fell quite ill, so sick he couldn't work in his rice fields. And Mukta wanted to help. Um, and so she readily agreed to follow the footsteps of an older sister and moved to Dhaka and um, ended up with a job in this uh, place called Beauty Garments Limited, the name of the factory. And over the years, she worked her way up to, to um, operate a sewing machine. And her job basically is sort of smoothing the fabric and pushing it through the machine. Um, and she does one task, and that is she sews side seams on women's blouses. And she does that um, every day, six days a week, ten hours a day, sometimes more. She says she's eager to get uh, overtime because that's when uh, to work extra hours because that's when she makes more money. Um, and um, this is all she does. She has a helper, like most of these. This is this young younger uh, girl who takes the garment out, snips the threads, and moves them between stations. Um, and um, Mukta does this, as I mentioned, you know, every day. Um, and her task is to attempt to get pushed through a thousand blouses every day. Um, she makes uh, about forty-seven cents an hour um, with oh, that's with overtime, which works out to be about eighty-seven dollars a month. Um, and she sends nearly half of her money home to her family. Um, and I would say that this really is a sweatshop. Um, I think this is one of the better ones, but it's a sweatshop. It is hot. I wasn't doing very much other than scribbling my notebook and snapping a few pictures. You know. And these women were working hard, but I was just dripping sweat. And they have no air conditioning, big fans pushing around, um, pushing around the air. But it's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. And I felt very lucky um, not being thrown out. I was able to spend time with, with Mukta and three uh, other women who worked there. And also went um, with various permission, including their landlord, got to follow them home one, um, one evening. And they share a two-bedroom flat with another family um, and who are also factory workers and their daughter. Um, and this is the mother of the other family work, uh, uh, cooking in the kitchen. Um, and these four um, young women that I spent time with all work in the same factory. They, this is their room. It's uh, about ten, about twelve by twelve. Two sleep on the bed. Two sleep on a mattress on the floor. Uh, and every other week, they're very democratic. They switch off. And I was really fortunate, I mean, really, that they were so gracious in allowing me to talk to them. Um, you know, and they, uh, you know, they have. They don't have a lot. What they do keep is spare clothes and such. They keep in bags because there's so much road dust that comes in. You know, with a solid them, so they, they keep everything on the But after talking to them at the factory, without supervision, I should tell you, but, you know, and I get in the hole and several times. I keep saying, how can you stand this? Um, 
you know, the heat and the noise and the glare of the fluorescent lights and the mind nothing repetition, you know, 10 hours a day, 12 hours, six days a week, all for sort of a, what we think is a pretty lousy salary so you can sleep on the floor half the time. I mean, why? And they kind of looked at me perplexed and they said, you know, they said, they can, you know, uh, com you know com compared to what? You know, this is, you know, this isn't all bad, you know, and it's, it's, you know, yes, of course, they'd like to make more money. They would mind some more free time. Um, but it's not that this job is so great. It's just that the other options that they have, you know, aren't, um, you know, aren't, often aren't any better. And most of the times, they're worse. They can work in the fields, which is one of the last things we want to do under the hot sun. Incredible humidity, you know, rain, you know, and very often for no pay. It's just, just to help produce food. They could become domestic servants to, to wealthy families. These are all um, women who came from poor families in, in rural, in rural Bangladesh. But those jobs are really fraught with problems. There's no day job for those workers. They're very often subject to incredible uh, uh, problems of like physical and sexual assault when they're young. Um, you know, uh, and you know, it's not much of an option. Or they could do, as as um, Mark talked about, uh, just join the ranks of all her girlfriends back in the home village that she went to school with. All of them were married before they were age 16. They moved into their husbands uh, with into the household with their husband's family. Um, they've all had children, you know, um, starting uh, you know, very young. Um, and they become nearly domestic servants in this um, the, the family's household, um, and they have um, they have very little power. In fact, probably the least power of anyone in the household structure. And um, you know, and they need permission to do things like leave the house, either from their husband or their mother's-in-law. And she said, when when Mukta said when she goes home to to, to see her old uh, school school friends, they kind of whisper, "Can't you take us with you?" She said their life is like is like a cage, and you know she feels like she has certain freedom. So I I think the point I'm just trying to make here is that that um, the story of the exploited garment worker is a bit more complex and a bit more nuanced. You know, and certainly the name brands and the big box stores, you know, that they are happy, more than happy, to profit off of the. Um, um, the cheap labor available in Bangladesh, and if they don't get it in Bangladesh, they'll go to another country. You know, but and, but these women do, for the most part, work willingly in the factories. Sometimes they're forced to work in longer hours than they like, and other things. But they work willingly because, in a way, they're able to sidestep other kinds of exploitation in this very traditional, conservative male-dominant society. And an outside a job outside the home can be a great equalizer. In, in these situations, it can help them escape early marriage and, and um, early childbearing and coming under the thumbs of these mothers-in-law when they're very young and, and, um, and really not very well equipped to, to stand up for themselves. Now, I don't want to, for a moment, let you think that I'm giving the garment industry a pass or any of these factories. Um, they can do better, clearly, you know, especially in health and safety issues. And, you know, and, and I've talked to a lot of activists who say, you know, it really wouldn't cost that much to really make a difference in their lives. Um, but even the, the, garment, um, uh, the garment worker activists that I um, have, have talked to and spent time with, um, they say that the, the industry has been an incredible boost to, um, to uh, women in Bangladesh, helping them move from the margins of society to the center. And it's really about the power of the patient and, and how um, it gives some power, autonomy, and self-direction to those in the society who have very little of So I'm going to stop there and, and bring on the real expert on this. And this is Sajid Ali. And, um, and it just, so she didn't fully introduce her. Sajid um, was, uh, I found out, was born in Pakistan, um, but actually raised in Bangladesh. Um, uh, and she is an expert in studies of the, of the lives and work opportunities of women and girls in Asia and Africa. Um, she, uh, she was born and raised in Bangladesh, but she has a PhD in sociology and demography from Princeton. Um, 
and really an expert in everything from microfinance uh, to education to um, work opportunities, um, child marriage. Um, and uh, I think you'll find, like I did, I've heard more pearls of wisdom come out of her mouth than just about anybody I've ever talked to in this, uh, in this, uh, in this situation. So. Thank you so much, Ken. Now you've set me up. Pearls of wisdom, here they come. <laughs> um, I, um, because I knew that I was following these two great acts, um, I couldn't possibly outdo their storytelling. I thought I'd take a slightly different tack um, uh, and kind of situate the story of the of Rana Plaza. Um, and the garment industry where it is now with 4 million workers, uh, most of them um, into the recent historical context. Uh, and it's in a way sort of how I have experienced um, uh, the, the how I've grown my interest in uh, garment work. Um, so this is a sector <coughs> that in Bangladesh the first factory was set up in the late 70s when the level of workforce participation of women was less than 1% in urban Bangladesh. Uh, there was hardly any uh, workforce opportunity at all, let alone formal sector work. The garment sector came along, grew very quickly. Um, I had a little slide showing how exactly how fast it grew. Um, but uh, now it's about 4 million workers um, in um, factories mostly concentrated in and around uh, the urban centers. There are certain things called export processing zones that are even higher end factories. And many of us, um, I was in graduate school when this big upswing of factory work was ha happening and a lot of the feminist economists, sociologists I looked up to um, had written about the experience of women working in garment factories and how what it had meant. And they wrote books like the first, first book I read was about uh, titled No Better Option. Um, and it was all about what the opportunities were, um, uh, what, what could be done to make uh, life better. But it, like you have heard today, it kept going back to we need to remember that for these women, it was uh, the best that could happen. It's okay. If you I'm sorry. That's okay. Better, it was fine. Yeah. Um, so, and, and part of this story of no better option and is, is important, but we don't want to be cultural relativists. We don't want to make an overly relativist case. But I, I still think it's worth remembering what the profile of workers is. Not staying. Okay. Anyway, this uh, the the yeah. <laughs> Two of them is the same. Yeah. That's okay. Don't worry about it. So it's basically um, a sector that grew extremely rapidly over the course of some two decades um, or three decades to where it is now. Um, it started. It has a very interesting. Um, economic history. Um, I, some of you may know um, the most buyers in Bangladesh are of South Korean or Sri Lankan origin. And the reason is so they are the intermediary uh, of uh, people who buy the from the locally made factories, people who are commissioning. That's kind of the front end of the commissioning side of factory production. And the reason they are from Sri Lanka and South Korea is because these are two countries that were looking for new places to manufacture their products. Um, they had hit a quota limit from on the uh, in terms of exporting to the U.S. The U.S. had very specific quotas of what countries could send to, um, and uh, when South Korea reached its limit, it was looking for a cheap place to produce uh, more. Uh, more and Bangladesh was one of those cheap places. Sri Lanka for a different reason because of their civil war 
they shifted a lot of their production uh, to Bangladesh. And these um, uh, these buyers had some very interesting sort of innovations that they proposed to uh, in terms of how to recruit workers, in terms of how to um, So anyway, these are just some uh, pictures of the the very fast pace of growth, um, which was kind of my point. Um, and I think the fact that between the mid-80s to now, um, the workforce has expanded 20 folds or something, um, factories have expanded, is both um, sort of a cause for a celebration for some people in terms of how it employs women. But it's also perhaps the reason behind what we are seeing in Rana Plaza. And I kind of want to, this is entire almost conjecture, uh, but I want to make the point that Dhaka City now, this is a picture of Dhaka City, and the red dots are garment factories in the city. Dhaka City now, um, within the city, um, which is in this area, there's almost no room to have any more factories, or any more people for that matter. One more person than the the whole city will collapse, you know. Um, so a lot of the factories are going to the outskirts. Both Rana Plaza and Tazreen were in some of these uh, peripheral areas of Dhaka City, which I think was behind some of the lower regulatory standards, some of the uh, worst conditions, um, uh, that which sort of, I, I hope, explains the worst forms of violation of um, rights. Um, but uh, And that is a phenomena of the very rapid pace of growth that this sector has gone through. Um, I think uh, turning back to the women who come to work, um, even though it's such a big workforce now, um, it's still the case that the kinds of women who take up this kind of work um, are um, are from very disadvantaged situations. They're much more likely to be from landless households. They're much more likely to be like Mukta Mulla from these, uh, the outer reaches of Bangladesh, the southern districts. Um, there's actually quite a concentration of where these women come from to work. Um, very often because the land, family has lost land to river erosion or a father has become a disabled. Um, it's much more likely to be the case that that's the sort of women who come to work in factories. And um, there, what's more important is we often think of workers as coming by themselves to to the city. Um, in fact, they come along with two or three sisters and their families. The entire family moves over to both provide, because that's how they can provide the support to that family. Like Ken mentioned, they tend to send back, if they leave family behind, they tend to send back money to support the families. Um, they're much less likely to have an education. In Bangladesh, uh, we just did a survey um, in a rural area of Bangladesh. 99% of girls go to school. Um, and the average girl by the age of 19 has eight years of education. Government workers, about 50% have no education at all. And about, and if when they do have education, it's usually about four years of education. So they have much less, um, they've already had much less opportunity. They've already reached a point where this was the better option for them, and that's why they moved. Um, I think, uh, I've always thought that if you go and ask a 13-year-old in, in these districts that send a lot of girls to, to the cities to work, what those girls would want to do, government work wouldn't be their first priority. This is not what they would opt to do. Um, and so I think in terms of kind of thinking about uh, doing something for that benefits women, thinking about what is it, and this is kind of my job, that's what I do for a living, is to think about what are the best opportunities uh, that one can think about. Um, it's providing opportunities uh, for girls so that garment work is perhaps not the only option, or at least it's one of the many options that they have. 
is the way I would like to see it. And in fact, we are now actually trying. Um, it's uh, I happen to think that actually giving life skills, giving better negotiation skills, giving um, sort of a stronger notion of rights and and the ability to exercise those rights. Those are the sorts of things that will make a difference. Um, but also kind of skills to occupy other newer sectors um, for women. Um, my, my own vision of Bangladesh is that um, in addition to the garment sector, there will be electronics, there will be ICT-based opportunities for women where, just like in the garment industry, where um, uh, I think it was easy for the workforce to be 90% women because it was seen as women's work, um, sort of nimble finger, fingers kind of thing. And men didn't feel threatened that their jobs were being taken. Um, so I think in terms of moving, looking forward, we need for girls these sorts of opportunities that um, emphasize um, th that are not seen as a threat uh, by, by men, um, but also um, that starts women off on kind of an opportunity where they have a range of options. Um, we're not there yet. I just wanted to have a couple of minutes, maybe. I want to show you that Bangladesh still is in a situation where uh, we're basically competing on wages. Uh, our wages are, uh, what, a fourth of what Chinese wages are, uh, and lower than just about any of the competitors. Um, and I think this could change um, happily. And if, if I were to argue for reform in the sector, I would, I would focus on the wage aspect of it. And this is not just that it's low, but that it's remained static over the years that this sector has um, grown so fast. In 1994, the entry level for a job was $22. By in 2006, it was the equivalent of $21. And 2010, it was up to 38, but only because there was a minimum wage legislation uh, that they were signed on. So I think I personally think that this whole issue of wage negotiation is kind of the critical element of where we want change, in addition to the general sort of structural issues. Um, let me just. Thank you so much, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Things always work beautifully before you have a room full of people. Um, so I think um, because um, we are, we've already had three speakers. I want to go ahead and open it up for questions. So, so please, um, yes. Yeah. Just one. Oh, let me. I'm gonna give you a mic. Uh -oh. Maybe. Oh, I have a mic. And so for all of you as well, when you're when you're asking your questions, so everyone in the back can also hear, please hold it right up to your mouth. Yeah, this is just a just first thanks to all of you. A quick observation. It wasn't so long ago that this was in the United States. In fact, my grandmother worked in a uh, sweatshop garment factory and lost the use of an eye by being accidentally poked in the eye with a scissors. So that's, you know, not so long ago in the U.S. we had this situation. So let's hope it advances in Bangladesh as well. We have a Twitter question, um, which is really exciting. <laughs> so uh, Justine Jabinaska, and if you're watching, I'm sorry if I just killed your last name, is uh, watching the live stream of this and has a question for Jason and Ken, which is what sort of local response, if any, has there been to your investigative work? Well, it's, it's early days. I, I can't speak specifically to my work. I think, you know, in the wake of any outsized tragedy like this, it's drops in a bucket. And um, fortunately, I'm going to have to run a closet. It took something this large to really hasten the, the attention of the international media. And compared to past incidents, I think there was really sustained coverage and more follow through um, than, than usual. And I think that has continue to apply a, a needed degree of pressure on a lot of the brands that do source garments from Bangladesh to start to clean up their acts. Um, 
the, 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 the most substantial thing I've done is this this longer report, and um, you know, really for me it wasn't hitting any one point. I just wanted to try and, and personalize this as much as possible to really zoom back in on those who are affected, make sure that the individuals are not forgotten, and try and communicate their story in a way that no matter where we are, that you know, we can relate to at some human level. Did you do it with another twenty? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious. When you mentioned the game with those tags, it was a different start. You said it was called the Zara. Um, oh, God, it was probably like six years ago. I went to a talk at the Swedish Embassy of Fashion Guides Poverty. They said Zara goes into these countries like China and makes sure that they you know, have a decent level of them. So I'm kind of wondering, and I'm, I'm assuming that's true, um, you said that some of these places are outsourcing to another one. Um, is this like a, a big of a problem that is? But then you were saying that, oh wait, I'm not sure what kind of you was talking to it, and you said that this was a good life living in that apartment. Um, I'm somebody who basically avoids buying anything made in a third world country because I know that this kind of stuff's been going on. And it's also affected the manufacturing in the United States, and there's a lot of people who lost their jobs, but it's becoming harder and harder to do. But then you see women like that, and as deplorable as it is, it's better than the other options. So would any of you think it's a good idea for it to continue buying, these, buying things from these countries? I'll go for it. Yeah, it's a question I get asked a lot you know, after what I saw there. And, you know, this was made earlier, this point that it doesn't matter who you talk to, two men or women in Bangladesh, whether they're you know, labor rights activists, certainly owners, um, politicians. Um, everybody wants the garment industry to stay in Bangladesh. And I think, in fairness, you know, it's still early days. This is a young country. Um, the industry has grown very rapidly overnight, and it has created a lot of opportunity. Um, there have been tragedies. You know, people talk about ten, uh, Rana Plaza as um, a sort of a modern day um, a triangle shirt with voice yeah. fire, which was a turning point for you know, labor rights and conditions in the United States. But the impact, the reforms that emanated from that event took years to uh, be implemented and to really you know, change the, the landscape in the United States. It's still, you know, it's just a year. and. Um, I think this has been a, a resounding wake-up call for a lot of people. Um, personally, I see you know Bangladesh as one great asset. It's it's, it's manpower. I mean, it's a lot of woman power, but it's its workforce. And these a lot of these women do need these jobs, and, and they change their lives in doing so. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily want to see the garment industry leave Bangladesh. I just think we as consumers and, and you know, we vote with our purchasing power. And influence the decisions of these companies. Just have to feel more conscientious in the way we do that, and we need to demand more. It's made in Bangladesh. Well, you know, who is supplying it, and what kind of diligence are they doing to vet their supply chain to ensure that these loose ends are not lingering? And you know, a big part of that is subcontracting. So, in the face of it, there have been a lot of things kicked into gear by these tragedies. Those are the frontline factories. The open secret is that so much of this work is outsourced to illegal off-book subcontractors. And even in the wake of all these big reforms and all the hype, that remains. And I talked to a top 10 producer off the record, but he said, look, I'll, I'll lay it down for you. This is what the way it really is. He said, everybody still does it. He has certificates for H&M above his head, and they have really stringent standards. They've signed on to this new accord. You know, They are the ones who are doing good, and yet he concedes anonymously that is outsourcing a lot of his work when there's real deadline pressure to make these, these large orders for fast fashion to subcontractors that get no scrutiny. And therein lies the problem, and that's where the abuses are allowed to happen. So I think it's, it's been a good start, but it needs to go further and sort of take into account the lower runs of this industry. You know, they might be in basements or in rooftops, but a lot of work is done. It's and, and the thing that really bugs me about this, it's not H&M or even Zara, because they're stuff you can pull prices very cheap, get what you pay for. I see labels like Ralph Lauren. I will never buy Ralph Lauren, ever. Um, you know, he designed the, uh, the not the last, the, fix, the 
the, the Olympics in um, the previous Olympics, they were like thousand dollar outfits. They're all made in China, and you can go into Ralph Lauren or or um, the cost, and it's all made in these countries, and they're they're not giving a, a discount to American or other country consumers. And it just makes me so angry. And then I see all these companies. You know, they, they used to make they used to have a textile industry in the United States. That's completely gone. We don't make anything here now. Sasha, do you have a in here too? Um, well, I think this work for me is really interesting because people connect in this way. But one of the questions that I would throw back to you is, would you would you not feel connected if you weren't wearing a Bangladesh-made shirt? I mean, would would that help, given that everyone around you is? Or I mean, does it help to not buy? I mean, does it help to sort of um, boycott? You know, is that if if it's you know feeling angry or guilty that you're wearing something that was made by someone who would pay the pittance, um, and if you chose not to wear it, you made your own clothes. Would that make you feel better? I'm not sure that it would. And I think once part of the story that we're trying to say is. Um, this uh, hard as it is, it's it's actually a better option for these girls. Not that it couldn't be improved. So I would actually go in the direction of thinking about what you can do for girls, for women, to expand these opportunities. That is not about sort of boycotting, and I think that's sort of a more proactive stance in other avenues, education for girls, skills development for girls. I'm just going to add one little, one little bit to that, and that is that um, in talking to the labor activists in, in DACA, they very, uh, very much um, are opposed to boycotts to any specific label or um, you know, any specific um, a store chain, you know, even though they're at it. They said, from the perspective of a worker, these are all pretty much interchangeable. They said, and there's so much, you know, as, as Jason mentioned, so much, you know, shifting around that that they, they just don't think it makes a lot of difference from the standpoint of the worker, whether it's one brand or another. Now, that's not to say that American consumers and European don't have power through, you know, through, um, through their pocketbook and through um, lobbying country, uh, excuse me, companies to do better, but they said that really, unless governments, you know, government to government sort of holds these folks to task, that you're not going to see a lot of changes because these these uh, these companies are out to make money and simply move on to another place, you know. And it, it was very interesting in Bangladesh, which you know there there was, as I understand it, huge changes in child labor that was only merely the threat in, um, of um, of uh, a law in the in the U.S. Congress that you know sort of banning you know, imports or anywhere child labor, and all of a sudden, you know, all these kids were fired basically. When all of the factors just changed overnight, and uh, you know, so it's you know, it doesn't even have to be law, law but merely just the threat that something like this is going to happen. Now that our view of child labor and theirs is different. I mean, the law has recently changed, but I think you can legally work in a factory at age 14. That's what they can do. So. So what are the best avenues for putting pressure at the country level? And either you know any of you can answer that. Yeah. I, I mean I don't really know except what the labor activists say. They say that government really has to hold these factories to account. So that that's so how do you that, get the government to, to do that? Who's a fellow? Right. You said that the industry started. You said that the industry started about in the 1970s, which gives us a record now of more than 40 years, which is a couple of generations. And I'm wondering, is there any evidence that the younger generation chooses to go into another line of work, that the parents did the basic work and the children are going off, or are the children doing the same thing as the parents? Um, in the, the 2011 survey we did, we asked uh, workers, so not quite what you're saying, but we asked workers how they spent their savings. And the biggest investment was in education for siblings and for um, their children. 
and uh, the sense is that you know once you have that education, you're not going to come to work in a government factory. You're going to go somewhere else. So I would say it's uh, looking for uh, a different to, towards a different sector of the economy. That's actually like your question. Um, as an alternative to government work, what sectors, and based on your research, are you encouraging, or would you encourage uh, women to gravitate towards in Bangladesh? So, I'm, here's a plug for my project. I'm uh, doing some skill development um, to acquaint girls and women to computers and to technologies, I, communications technologies. Um, and I feel like um, the sorts of things that uh, would would be ideal for these women um, are things that have that require a certain level of education, not, but not very high levels of education. So I would say ICT. A lot of people have talked about electronics. There's some development of um, uh, agricultural processing type plants, um, which I don't think are going to be qualitatively that different from factory works. But I think ICT holds more promise. Um, my question is to uh, Mr. Samin. You said the dark city is uh, uh, expanding and there is no place people can make any building or anything. But still, the government's factories are mostly in Dhaka city. Uh, how the government is permitting the Garment industries uh, owners to uh, make their factories in this city, and uh, there are many examples that uh, buildings without without any permission uh, they are making the stories uh, five stories building they are making sixth or seventh stories without any permission, and uh, incidents like Rana Plaza and uh, Thursday garments are major, but there are many other minor incidents like factory fires and building collapse happened. Uh, people don't know what the government is, uh, what measures the government is taking and what, how the international buyers are pressuring the government to ensure the safety of the workers in government industries in Bangladesh. <laughs> um, well, as you know, we actually have really good safety uh, laws in the books. Um, the And these laws go back a long way in terms of uh, factory code, fire regulations, etc. The problem is um, that the people who are in charge of implementing them are not, um, can be paid off, can be bought off. And I think uh, that's where you need a lot of creativity. The, the one so the glimmer of hope I've seen is the civil society and NGOs stepping in to uh, work um, in some of these capacities that are meant to be done by the government. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, what you're putting more pressure on the government is not going to get us there. Um, but I think you need sort of independent ombudsman. The role, the media's role, is really important, and there has been a huge change in the way in which media performs, which is a different story. Basically, 10 years ago, the government was the only media, and now there are lots and lots of private channels, radios, and that sort of thing should change. But I think that really it's the impetus has to come from civil society. So there's this company, and I swear I don't work for them, um, but it's called Everlane. And um, I don't know if people have heard of it, but they basically part of their marketing strategy is transparency. So when you go on their website, you can see where the shirt that you're ordering is made. And it's in places like um, China, Malaysia. Um, and you can see pictures of the factory, and they have the names of the factory manager. Um, and it's part of what they how they sell themselves to people. So it's clearly an attractive concept. Um, is that something you see companies doing, where we have a consumer that's wanting to know where their clothing is coming from, wanting to know what the lives of the people that are making their clothing is like? 
Do you see that as something that companies maybe are going to sell as part of their concept, and that could be something that, that helps with the transparency of the factories and of the whole supply chain? Or do you see that as just a <laughs> crazy dream of a small sort of boutique company? I'd like to see more of that. I actually know of a small boutique company based out of Los Angeles, and I <laughs> checked out their operation. And they wanted me to sort of put a journalistic eye to the way uh, their you know, products were being made. And um, they'd actually arranged this, this whole partnership and created a best-selling product without actually visiting Bangladesh. It was just on good faith. And the project was managed as a women's co-op in the north in a town called Sanipur. It was managed by a very um, ethical kind of patron manager who um, had employed a lot of uh, war widows of independence uh, in a small startup and with support from various Canadian and European organizations had built it into a thriving women's co-op and a lot of these women had translated that work into college degrees for their daughters and had gone from living in shanty homes into concrete homes and were plans for a community center and others. So that's great. Um, I think that's kind of the exception still. And you know when you get to DACA you really can appreciate just the scale that these garments are being produced at these huge football field sized multi floor facilities. And you know, the bottom line for so many of these businesses is just getting those orders. You know, HM, 12 seasons a year, fast fashion. Keep turning around, which just creates a lot of pressure. And um, to date, among the big boys, we have not seen a lot of, of investment in real transparency. I think some of the smaller companies could set. An example for what is possible. Um, but then there are you know, organizations like Walmart that claim they conduct audits, but they don't actually make the results public. They should be mandated to, to publicize those results and to show how they came to those conclusions. Because as we've seen in the past, time and time again, companies get ratings from, from auditors that they will hire. And these ratings really have no reflection on the reality of these facilities. You know, after Tesreen had an upgraded rating, it burned down. The doors that were stored, the exit uh, doors that were missing were still missing. It's a very basic stuff. So I think first we can do that, and then we can get into making the, the model, the whole supply chain, more transparent. I agree, it should be, it should be a selling point. And I'd like to see more companies capitalize on that. I wanted to relate that to one of the really fascinating charts that Sajid, that you showed that the, the, the wage rate in China in Vietnam now double, quadruple what it is in, in Bangladesh. And these were the countries that were the sources of cheap textiles uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. How did that happen? Is, is Bangladesh on a similar trajectory? And, and, and it's interesting to think about, well, where is the next Bangladesh? And is, is, that, is that trade now moving, or will it move to, to Nigeria, to Kenya, other parts of Africa? And, and is Bangladesh on the same upward trajectory that we saw in, in China and in the other Southeast Asian countries in terms of wage rates? I would say not yet, but I think in terms of wage rates, the only way to get Bangladesh on that upward trajectory is to create opportunities around uh, in other sectors and to create the development. But I and think that's why it happened in China, in your view? I would. Th I don't know enough about China, but I do know about Vietnam that uh, it, the wage rates are across the board, um, and garments is an outlier. Bangladesh. It's still true that garments is the major employer of uh, women, at least. And first, you have the market segmented, the labor market segmented in terms of only hiring women, and then women don't have many options. So I think that's kind of the wage question. Mm, there, uh, I think there was quite a scramble among uh, buyers and producer retailers to look for other options, like in Indonesia. Um, there is a, a project in uh, Mauritius and uh, in Jordan to try and move some of this manufacturing to the, those places. I think they have not been as successful because they have not been able to uh, do some of the clever little tricks that the garment sector did. Uh, maybe it was a historical accident. 
one of which is this um, way of giving credit to um, factory uh, owners uh, based on letters of credit. Basically, it's based on a work order um, that allowed a lot of this rapid growth of factories to occur. We're not seeing that in Kenya and Nigeria. Um, so I think it kind of depends on how they capitalize on things. And also sort of the historical accident of quotas and people looking for new places to fill, fill quotas um, is, is not part of the story anymore. So it's not really just add one thing to that, and that is that um, my understanding is that China is having a hard time finding enough seamstresses these days, which is probably driving wages up. But then some of the poor countries that one could think that the industry could move to, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, that they've got problems that the industry shies away from. They don't have reliable electricity. They're incredibly corrupt. Um, and they don't always have access to ports. And those are three things that the industry needs. And that has become a issue in Bangladesh with the incessant uh, general strikes, they call called cartels, uh -huh. because it disrupts the supply chain. And there's, there's a, you know, these are, the Christmas orders have to come through and they need it, and, you know, the, the industry is demanding it. And if you have anything that can disrupt that, that's a, that's a problem. And so a lot of them are shying away from Africa for that. So, right. We have a Twitter question. Uh, we have another Twitter question um, from I know, I'm so excited right now. Um, from Justine, who you've answered, you've addressed this a little bit, but on a more very basic day-to-day -day level, what can be done to educate consumers about using their purchasing power? So say someone who's never really heard about how, I mean, most people know a little bit about this, but people who don't have as much education, how can they be educated about their consumer power? One measure is um, you know, going online. There are various organizations that uh, have been on this issue for a long time, and you know, in the wake of Rana Plaza, they've uh, compiled listings um, of, of big name companies that we know that we have you know, shown a strong track record in enforcing compliance and investing in factory safety, particularly those who have signed on to the accord, first and foremost, because um, it's, it's a legally binding arrangement, and it means investing in Bangladesh for five years. So while the alliance actually gives some companies, mostly American, the option to leave and opt out, it does not mandate investment. The Accord, you know, it, it's, it's both a guiding document, but it also um, is about digging into the industry and you know, continuing what's, what's already been started and, and creating jobs, but just better jobs for the workers who are there. So I think that's a, that, that umbrella is a place to start, and it covers a lot of very prominent companies, um, from H&M uh, to, to Calvin Klein, and um, more, you know, are signing on by the week, and you know, a lot of these, these bigger brands also have smaller subsidiaries um, that are, you know, by default also bound to the terms of the accord. So that that's an important step. But then independently, there are other organizations that, that are betting. Um, just to ensure that even the ones who posture as being the model companies are actually living up to the letter of their commitments. Can we have one more Sorry. Hello. Um, so we heard about um, the private sector initiatives that come mostly from outside of Bangladesh, um, like the Alliance and the Export Initiative. Um, and we also heard about uh, some initiatives that come from um, the Bangladeshi government or state um, to improve those workers' lives uh, or working conditions. And my question is, um, do the private sector initiatives in some way influence the um, variety or, yeah, well, initiatives that would come from the state or that could come from the state? Like, um, is it more difficult to put out state initiatives or law costs um, set into place um, because there's a, a, a big um, initiatives coming from outside of Bangladesh via the companies that produce in Bangladesh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the Korean families that, that 
set up their shops over there. I think that's what you okay. Yeah, does it, uh, are there are private initiatives that are set into place discouraging, for example, um, that laws are made to protect those workers or the safety of those workers or improve the safety of those workers? Uh, I, I think the one big private initiative that's the, that uh, stymies a lot of efforts that you might want to make is the manufacturers' unions. The, both the government, BGMEA, is, um, works with one voice, and it's a very powerful union. Um, there is a similar union for knitwear, uh, for the BKMEA, and I think those uh, those unions actually have a lot of clout. Um, one of the things that they can manipulate is exchange rates. It's in their favor to keep exchange rates going up, so that they're, you know, because they're looking at working dollars. So I think, uh, and um, they resisted the minimum wage changes quite a bit. So I, there are these very specific organized efforts. I don't know if that's what you mean. Um, Within the country, um, that no, has I was a actually problem. talking about um, laws made by the government to secure, for example, minimum wage or um, protect um, you know children from getting pregnant, and like that, or working as factories, etc., etc. Um, are they kind of discouraged because there is maybe a larger private initiative? Is there any? Well, it's the BGMA and the BKMA. They're very well organized. And they're very powerful. And they're the ones who resist change. Okay. I have a last question. It has to be really, really, really short. Really, short really, really short, short question. We can, we can talk more. And we can, we, well, we can continue uh, outside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is there the an initiative the government is uh, here, here. doing something here. like? Uh, like in PZ, is there anything uh, going on for the government sector? Is there any job for the government factories to be uh, together? Um, there are APZs specifically for garments. They who owns an entire export processing zone in Chittagong. Um, uh, but APZs don't work in favor of workers necessarily. You're not allowed to unionize. Is one of the big things about export processing zones. Um, they're usually higher wages, etc. But no, I'm asking about in government's village, the factories will be together in one place. Is no, there a plan? Any. And I don't. I wouldn't. Go there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much, Jason, Ken, and Saji. That was really uh, wonderful. Time. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll continue the conversation outside, and uh, not actually outside.